3D design and also working in 2.5D. So what do we mean by 2.5D? Uh, we'll get into it a bit, but um, a lot of it just comes down to designing in two dimensions with the express purpose of eventually making them into 3D objects, just to kind of get that first question out of the way. Today will also be a little bit of a review of a lot of the things we've been covering uh, through these various lectures. And so again, we're hoping if you have any questions, anything you want to share, don't be afraid to let us know. So the first thing we want to talk about, um, 2.5D construction is something that goes across a lot of different um, methods. You can see here from this example video, uh, which is part of the process used to make the desk that you see on the side of your screen there. So this is an example of 2.5D design. We're using a two-dimensional stock, cutting out two-dimensional pieces, and then putting those together um, to create a three-dimensional form. Now, this does require uh, a bit of prototyping in certain cases, um, but also making sure you use a lot of different processes and tools that we've been talking about to make it work for you. So you can see here they made a laser-cut prototype and then brought it over to the Gerber to make the full-size uh, version of it. Using the laser cutter at the start was actually a very effective way to do this because as we've learned, the laser cutter and the CNC can be very similar in how they work. And so you can see from this design, it's slowly being cut out. Different pieces are coming out as part of the process. And you can see how eventually all those 2D components, once removed and cut out of this big 4 by 8 sheet, can be assembled into the table that you see. And in fact, if you've been to Makehaven, you've noticed that this table has actually been out there in the space. And I think it's still used actually for the, um, for the Cintiq tablet that we have downstairs. So that's pretty cool. It's still a very usable piece of furniture. So today we'll be covering a little bit more about what G-code is, um, advanced 3D printing con concepts, uh, just kind of some little tips and tricks that come along the way with 3D printing. We'll also talk about some tools that are not used as commonly around here, uh, which 3D scanning, which we do have a little bit of capabilities for in the space. I think our 3D scanner is currently down at the moment, or at least I'm not quite sure anybody knows where it is at the moment. Um, and then we'll get, again, cover some 2.5D uh, construction and talk a little bit about um, some file types and how they work and help us out in various ways. So the next slide, here we go, G code. So remember, these are the instructions that actually tell the machines what to do where to put the tool head, where to put the extruder head if it's a 3D printer, where to bring the laser to if it's the laser cutter. And it is, again, uh, abbreviation of geometric or geometry code. So remember, uh, what you're seeing right now is a simulation of a tool path um, and how the G code is telling the tool to move in three-dimensional space in order to cut out a specific object. Again, everything uses G-code. Any tool that is using CNC, com computer numerical control, needs G-code to tell it what to do. So with 3D printing comes some of those advanced 3D printing tricks. Um, these are some things that actually help us in terms of kind of upping our 3D printer game. So, What's cool is um, that you can access the Octopi control system from any, uh, which is any of the um, 3D printers at Makehaven, from any computer on the Makehaven Wi-Fi, which is pretty cool. So you do have to at least be on our Wi-Fi to use uh, the uh, 3D printing uh, control system from any computer connected to the Wi-Fi, but that means you don't have to be exactly at the computer that is directly hooked up to the 3D printers. Um, now, this means you can also skip using a USB driver to transfer files and stuff like that. It allows you to use your own home computer setup or laptop, whatever you have, to kind of make it a little bit easier for you. Um, and then you're also able to kind of pre-slice everything and get it over to the machine without having to, again, use the file bucket or use your own USB or anything like that. It can add a lot of extra steps to the process. So... Another thing that we talked about when we talked about 3D printing are supports. 
So again, there are instances where 3D printers need the support material to actually allow something to be constructed. You can see in the example of this Anubis bus that there are extra components that are printed onto the model. Those support structures allow the print to actually become successful and actually avoid it from, as you can see here in this example, if the extruder just shoots out of the space, those strings just fall straight to the ground. These supports give them something for the plastic to actually stick to and create different overhangs. Now, there are certain instances where you actually do not have to worry about support material when you're designing something. You can see in the diagram on the bottom half of the slide that shows those orange examples. Typically, if you're at or below 45 degrees, um, you don't necessarily have to have support material on that overhang. But it's also more effective when you have a full slanted path that leads up to a point. Anything greater than 45 degrees, you will need some kind of support material. Or as you can see in the example over on the right, the angled surface is perfectly fine, but if you had what is called a cantilever, just a straight thing shooting out from a material, you are going to need some kind of support material because again, there is a layer that has nothing underneath it. But also you can see from the red car being printed at the bottom there, that um, orientation also affects how we may need to have printing support. So you can see in that model, by turning the car on its side, they made it such that they don't need any support material in order to complete the model because all the different slanted angles that form the actual outside of the car are all different 45 degree angles. That means no support material is needed to make that object. In certain cases, also rotating your model to be on its flat side or being sideways or in certain cases upside down may allow it so that you don't need to have support material in its manufacture and may even increase its strength. For instance, in the example just above that red car, if I wanted to print the where it says the red X where that cantilever beam wouldn't be supported and therefore not capable of being printed, I actually could remove the need for supports by lying the cantilever down on its side, where if I rotated that whole model 90 degrees, so it's laying down on its wide side. So it looks like a C down on the ground if I'm looking down at it. That means now all it's just three walls that get printed. And what that also means is that the FDM, if we're using an FDM printer, all those uh, paths that the FDM printer makes will be in that C direction. Meaning that also in that plane of movement, it's going to be stronger. One thing to note about FDM prints is that you have to think about print direction in making sure your files are gonna be as strong as possible. In the example I just talked about with that cantilever beam, if it was printed as it's shown in that photograph, um, or that picture, I should say, it actually wouldn't be very strong. And I'll use my mouse to demonstrate. You can see right here, where it would be an unsupported plane, this would actually be a very, this corner here would be a gigantic stress concentration. Sharp corners are where stress can be concentrated and actually makes our prints weaker. And so if all our layer lines were going in this direction, that means that that stress concentration is going to be right at the seam where a layer is going to be. Meaning that that entire arm essentially becomes a lever that would allow you to snap that part off. But if we do the solution I said, where we laid it down on this darker face, we laid it down so that this was actually touching the work plane. That means all the layers would be uh, going around this shape, around the outside following this shape meaning that there is a contiguous shape making up that entire form so that there is an outline making that shape. So there are no layer lines at that stress concentration, making it a lot stronger. It's something that you'll get used to as you print more and experience more using 3D printers, but a good thing to keep in mind when you design parts. Print in place mechanisms are, and you can see there's a lot of gifts here of all different types of mechanisms. I don't know if they're uh, they're a little chuggy the way I'm seeing them, but they might be a little bit smoother where you are. Print in place mechanisms are some of the coolest things you'll see in 3D printing. If you spent a lot of time in the space, you've seen a lot of people have been printing the octopus that's um, print in place, where it's like a posable octopus once the printing is done. Print in place is fairly complicated to design for because what that means is 
you have all the components that are separate parts, but they can be printed all together at once. Meaning that there's enough space left between them in your design that once they're done printing, you can pop it off the print bed and everything can actually work, move, and function as you design them. That means you have to require a lot of, uh, have to include a lot of relief in your part designs. And you also have to do a lot of work making sure that um, it will move correctly and parts will stay together when you're done. Now I see there's a few things. Oh, okay, just some examples. Um, yes, Adam, thank you for sharing the silky smooth gifts we can all see um, if we're looking at the presentation at home. Now, print in place mechanisms can take a lot of different forms. Um, you can see that a lot of the ones, including the dragon, the printable uh, piston motor there, and the printable hand are essentially uh, captured joints, usually like a ball joint or a pin joint that can be printed in place and allow a specific movement in a one or multiple directions. That just means you're leaving enough space around that joint so that once those parts are captured by the finished print, they'll actually move around to be able to freely move within that space. Some components, like you can see the phone holder for the car or that spring open uh, secret box, use what's called um, living springs, and in certain cases, living hinges. In this case, you can see they've incorporated a spring by actually printing a spiral that can flex in two different directions. And they're also employing a geared mechanism to allow that spring tension to be transferred into some other type of motion. In this case, the rotation of the spring or the extension or contraction of the spring to actually drive uh, one gear to drive a pinion. Um, usually in gear parlance, the larger gear is sometimes called a uh, cog wheel or a wheel, and the smaller gear is usually called a pinion. And if you have a long straight gear, like you can see how on this phone holder, they have a long line of gear teeth, that's called a rack gear or just simply a rack. If you've ever heard rack and pinion, that's essentially what that phone device is using. So a little bit of some extra fun terminology there for you all to remember. So also, uh, I kind of talked about this a little bit, but uh, modifying your designs for stronger prints. So I have talked about how printing direction is really important and also to make sure that things will be aligned properly, that you don't have planes that are too thin and also paying attention to the print resolution of the printer that's going to be making the parts. If you have something that has incredibly fine, very, very tiny detail, an FDM printer is not going to be the best for that, especially if it's a finely detailed miniature or something. That's where a resin 3D printer, like our Formlabs printer, or any uh, type of uh, laser sintering printer, which we unfortunately don't have around here, are great at capturing those fine details. Um, and you can kind of see what I think is really important to talk about. I was talking about stress concentration before. And you can see that this image right here that says weaker and stronger is a little bit to what I was talking about. And the way you can think about stress concentration is literally thinking about how easy it would be to break if you had enough leverage. So for instance, if you think about a sharp right angle corner, and if I were to apply force to the end, I have an immense amount of leverage to snap that sharp corner. But you can see in the part labeled here where it says stronger, it has a radius applied there. Or if you remember the uh, 3D modeling version of that feature is called a fillet. Not a fillet, a fillet, because for some reason they like to have fun and pronounce things differently. But that curve breaks that stress concentration because there's no long lever arm that breaks that corner. Instead, when it's curved, there's no one point where you have maximized leverage. Instead, each lever arm almost becomes infinitely small along that curve and allows the force to be spread out across that corner. It's also effective for an edge treatment on many of your designs. Like if you have an edge that's overhanging and you fill it the edges of it to make it smoother and rounder, it also has the effect of making it a bit stronger and also allows the printer to make a more complete and concealed shape that can be better for the resolution of your print going forward. Um, it's always good when you're working with different 3D printers, understand how your printer works best. So you may want to experiment with prints downstairs with our FDM printers, the Formlabs printer, maybe even the Mark Forge if you want to get a little fancy. And understand how those printers behave and, and what kinds of uh, products they can produce. 
Thankfully, at Makehaven, we have a lot of examples nearby those printers. So use them for inspiration too, just to see how well the printers can create the parts you're looking to make. Again, infill is a very important thing to consider. We did talk about a lot of this at length. Again, how solid are the parts made? Usually at Makehaven, we kind of recommend between like a 25% infill. I think also a lot of them, a lot of the prints we run are 15% infill, which is strong enough for most general purposes, even for a lot of those print in place mechanisms that we've talked about. It helps to save on material and it also helps to save on printing time. <clears throat> What's interesting is um, the slicer is where you control how much infill there is, how solid the shape will be. And for certain prints, you may want it to be 100% fill. You know, if it's a very, very tiny part that's not going to have a lot of hollow space, you may want to opt for 100% infill, again, depending on its use case. But that'll be as you go through making something. Um, also, um, infill versus shell is something to consider. When something is infilled, it's a solid object that is hollow on the inside and it has this hashed infill pattern. And, and infill patterns, while here it shows a honeycomb, it varies by 3D printer and slicer program. So for instance, the Prusa slicer we use just uses like a random wave form as the infill. Uh, but some printers have hex cells. Other printers may use squares or just different lines at different angles. Just depends on your slicer. And if you'll excuse me one moment, I have to call. Sorry about that. But when something is a shell, it is a solid object that in and of itself is hollow. For any of you who have tried to actually make uh, the doghouse example model or any kind of object that has uh, open interior space, that's a shell. It is a solid exterior wall that has nothing inside of it intentionally. And those are different processes that you have. Uh, when you're designing something and also how it's going to look. In slicers, in certain instances, you may actually be able to apply that face style printing where it understands the solid object will become a hollow open container for something. And the next slide. And so another thing um, that you can do, so none of our printers actually support multi-material right now, um, which is the 3D printer can actually print in different colors or different types of materials through um, FDM printing. Also, um, certain other materials can be used as well. Um, you can it, it basically, there's other uh, really advanced techniques you can use. One I learned back in the day was, um, as you can see, where it's talking right next to the, um, the Benchy print here, which it's called Benchy because it's the standard benchmark print for 3D printers. Um, but in the slicer, you can actually tell the slicer where to put a pause in the print, where you actually tell the printer to stop at that moment and then start once the operator tells you to begin again. And that's an interesting point where you can change out filaments to have a different color. Some printers are built with multiple color reels and they can switch automatically. Ours, however, you'll need to do manually to change the filament. Other neat things you can do with pauses. You can actually incorporate things like solid acrylic windows into prints if you want. For instance, you could in your design have a hollow portion for an acrylic window to be inserted. Insert a small acrylic window and have the 3D printer actually encase that window as it continues the print. It's a pretty awesome thing to do um, as part of your printing and allows you to add multiple materials that are not just 3D printed materials. Um, also with FDM and to an extent certain resin printers, you can include all types of different materials uh, that have different properties, that require different types of curing, different types of treatment. Um, for here at Makehaven, we do have a resin printer that has three different grades of plastic, uh, regular, uh, high strength, and high, high temperature. Um, each of those are UV curing and our Mark Forge, like we mentioned before, uh, prints in carbon fiber and plastic mix that is also a lot stronger. 
But companies like Shape Aways actually allow you to print in things like metal, uh, print in things like all kinds of different grades of plastics, even clear plastics, hard plastics, different resolutions of plastics, even aluminum if you wanted. It's also incredibly expensive, so you might get a little sticker shock sometimes when you're doing that, as I've done many times. But it's a really cool resource, and just real, realize that you're not just limited by what can happen here at Makehaven, although Makehaven is pretty affordable when it comes to 3D printing, but uh, you won't get a lot of those crazy exotic materials um, if you ever want to print anything in metal, which is really freaking cool to do, and I've done on a few. There we go. So 3D scanning very quickly um, is basically using a few different tools to actually scan an environment. It can use either a collection of photographs um, through photogrammetry. And there's actually a lot of apps out there that will do this for you. Um, a lot of them uh, can be on your phone as well and uses your phone's front camera to capture 3D scans. So it's great for doing 3D scans of your face, like shown here in that green print. Um, or there are also other tools that can capture very large areas, like you can see here. Um, it's basically what helps power, you know, the Google Maps 3D view, just multiple pictures from different angles, uh, sort of combined into a three-dimensional object. Uh, you can certain times actually buy those 3D layouts and use them for projects. Um, and they will usually take the photo photographic data into a 3D model and export it by STL. But other methods also are um, using uh, stereoscopic and light 3D scanning, using um, different uh, ways of capturing using laser light, the dynamic shape of an object. Um, this is something that your phone can't do just yet. I'm sure eventually we'll get to an advanced point like this, but these are usually dedicated machines that are able to do this. They're used a lot in a lot of advanced engineering industries. Um, and actually a lot of engineering offices nowadays actually have 3D scanners as part of their uh, equipment. So if you happen to work for one or have a friend that works at one, they may be able to help you out and scan something for you, maybe for a nominal fee. But it basically uses laser light to essentially get uh, an example of depth, range, where it's located, and it's usually a bit more sophisticated than the photogrammetric methods. And then, of course, LIDAR scanning is kind of the evolution of the previous one. Um, and it actually, if you've ever uh, been, if you've ever seen like the top image here is showing a walkthrough of a house. If you've ever done been house hunting recently, and there are those weird instances where you can do like a walkthrough of a house, it's actually using this LIDAR scanning technology combined with photogrammetry because what it's doing is it uses the lidar to essentially capture the space and then photographs are basically planted on top of the 3d model it creates it's just really cool it uses lasers to scan the whole area to figure out how everything is shaped um and it's very accurate but also very expensive um there are some apps that will allow you to kind of incorporate some of these scanning tools because i'll a lot of phones do have some of the basic tools to get it done. Um, so, you know, experiment. I've toyed around with a few of them myself. And of course, there are some services that will scan stuff for you or also have libraries of stuff that's already scanned that you can use as a basis to move on from other stuff. Um, some of them may be free. Um, and it says probably with limitations. Uh, for instance, um, it's just like using stock photography. Um, you can't necessarily download it and use it to make money because it's a free open source item. Um, and they'll usually have some kind of agreement that if you download it, you're not using it for monetary gain, but just for a hobby or some artwork or something like that. So keep that in mind. And finally, let's uh, open up on 2.5 deconstruction. Again, making 3D things from 2D things. Um, so there are some tools that can actually uh, do this for you automatically. You can see that um, Slicer is a kind of unsupported uh, Fusion 360 plugin that will create a lattice structure for any three-dimensional object you include. Um, this is helpful, for instance, if you're looking to do an interesting art piece, like you can see this example here, like if you wanted to figure out how to build out the head of a rhino just using flat slices of it, um, you could use this program. 
Uh, any of you who watched the video and saw the example I shared yesterday of the uh, vacuum forming molds that I had to design back in the day, um, I basically did all of this the long way and actually calculated how to make each surface and go down each plane and then attach them by hand. Um, so having a plugin like this 10 years ago would have been super cool for me, but unfortunately I lived in the past. Um, but also um, for doing things like designing furniture, um, this is kind of the biggest challenge of pulling something into 2.5D by having flat stock that you can build into furniture. It requires a great deal of planning and a good understanding of not only how the machine is going to cut, but also how you're going to put it together. Uh, you also need to make sure you know the material well. Um, by that, how thick is it? I'm actually going to share a case study where I talk a little bit about doing this myself. Uh, so I'll leave it to when I share that little case study. Um, but stuff like Fusion 360 and SolidWorks and other CAD programs that support assembly, they are great tools, if not required tools for this kind of work, because it allows you to not only plan your separate parts, make them to the right thickness, make sure they fit and all your mortise and tenons lock together, uh, mortise being a hole in a piece of wood and tenon being the piece of wood that sticks out to go into the mortise. Just to highlight them on these parts, you can see there's a mortise, that little square hole, and a tenon like that sticks out here on this one. So just for a little bit of terminology there so you can follow along. But in SolidWorks Fusion 360, you can plan all that out, assemble them into the final part, but then also take them and lay them out to make sure they will fit on a four by eight sheet or a four by four sheet or a 30 inch by 30 inch sheet. Just making sure you can make the most of the material you're going to be using. Plywood is always a good choice for this. Um, you can see on the top example, um, it used um, CNC and three quarter inch wood, or probably they use maybe like a, um, they call it sheeting. So that might've been an OSB, an oriented strand board. Um, the second example using Baltic birch plywood to make very fancy and sophisticated looking furniture. Or in the bottom example, using something very thin and the laser cutter. All of them essentially working the same way, using different tools, but require the same amount of planning and forethought. So again, SVGs and DFF, uh, DXFs, kind of the uh, same side, uh, different sides of the same coin, really. So if you recall, anybody who's been exploring with Tinkercad, you'll know that Tinkercad can export in SVG, which as you remember, scaled vector graphics, the great exchange format that we use to have two-dimensional art transferred between not only the tools that are going to use that information, but also different programs that might play around with vector art. You would be exporting, for instance, if you design something in Tinkercad and you wanted to, for instance, laser cut it, you would export as SVG from the top plane and you would bring that over to Inkscape and then tell the laser cutter what to do with it. Um, from programs like Fusion 360, um, they like to use DXF, Drawing Exchange Format is what that stands for. That is actually the common, uh, the more common vector profile you see in a lot of engineering programs like Fusion 360 and SolidWorks. They almost never use SVG. SVG is considered more of a graphic design file format. DXFs are what you'll find. It's essentially the same thing. It's two-dimensional drawing data that can be interpreted by all the machines downstairs and it's also easily converted into SVG. Um, and a lot of my workflows, that's how I do it. Actually, I convert my 3D models to DXF and then I use Illustrator or Inkscape to arrange them into the right orientation on my stock and we'll export the whole thing as an SVG once I'm satisfied with the layout. Um, best practice here, um, especially if you're using Fusion 360, finish your 3D model, make sure it works, then export certain faces as DXFs. Uh, and it's as simple as essentially selecting the face you want to be used as a DXF and hitting export, and it will make the exact drawing of that face. So as you can see here, these are highlighted, save as DXF, it turns that into a two-dimensional drawing that can be interpreted by the laser cutter in the CNC.
Uh, and there's a uh, question here from Sean. Uh, can you export SVGs in Tinkercad for the cricket? Yep, <laughs> Adam's got you right there as well. <laughs> you can, it is all the same thing. It's two dimensional artwork. Um, so yeah, it's all the same. Um, and again, DXFs will let you build. Um, it's technically a bit more expansive um, in a lot of ways. Uh, DXFs are considered a bit more stable than SVG. Uh, they tend to hold on to their scale constraints much better than SVGs, and they're a bit independent of DPI settings and stuff. Uh, but some of those issues can still crop up between programs. However, um, DXFs are really what drive a lot of uh, 2D design, especially when using uh, programs. So um, the next thing to go to um, is to kind of really challenge yourself, especially moving into the next section, which is going to be electronics. You'll be worth working with Nathan Rowling, who is uh, really awesome, knows a ton about electronics, a ton about the metal shop. He is a very talented engineer in a lot of ways. So you'll be learning a lot from him about electronics. Unfortunately, you won't be seeing me around too much anymore. But I'm, of course, always in the space every Wednesday night. If you have any questions about 3D modeling or 3D design or 2D design, always there to answer questions. And of course, you can always find me on Slack if you have any questions as well. Adam, too. But, you know, Adam's also real busy. So, you know, we can spread around some of that, those questions to give him a little break. But um, make sure that when you have Fusion 360 or Onshape or any software you want that's freeware, downloaded, use with it, try making some advanced 3D constructions and try building those out into different 2D or 2.5D designs or think about 3D printing them. Again, uh, you always want to consider what you wanna make, the process you wanna to use to make it and the materials you're going to use in its construction. Those are the three important questions you need to know how you're going to bring your idea to life, especially when you've gotten to this point of really liking that form. Um, but what you're going to want to do to make a 3D object, you're obviously going to want to do 3D designs. What's also really cool is that you can do things like code blocks and circuits with Tinkercad. So again, uh, Sean, if you want to teach your kids about elementary circuit design and stuff like that, Tinkercad actually has a lot of tools to help you do that, especially if they want to explore different topics in engineering or anybody else listening. So, um, do, 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 do. My computer's a little angry right now. There we go. Thank you. So you go ahead and um, go to the plus block and click on it to create a new 3D design. And it will bring you into the 3D design space. There we go. So remember everybody, uh, the work plane, and it's trying to give me tips, but I don't need tips. Um, <laughs> I'm having a little fun here with this, okay? But um, the first thing we're gonna wanna do is um, make what our name tag is going to be on top of. So ideally, that's going to be some kind of flat object. Now. We can start from any of these cool geometric shapes and kind of build something from there. And this is, again, if we think about process, what we want out of it, what materials we're going to be using. Um, the thing I would consider to be most effective would be starting with um, a box and turning it into a flat rectangle. So I'm going to go ahead, pull a box out. And if we remember, see how there's that little circle on the bottom of the box as I drag it around? That's showing me where the box is going to snap. Now, since there are no other objects here, it's just snapping right down to that blue work plane that you see. So as I drag it around, it's just going to stick to that work plane unless I try to pull it away from the work plane and kind of make it float in space. Holding C 
while I'm doing this also snaps it to the work plane automatically. That's if you didn't want it to interact with any other objects you may have in space. So I'm going to let go, and that's going to plant the square right in place. And again, I get all my helpful tools here. So remember, it's in millimeters. <clears throat> so for a little bit of shorthand, it's about 25 and a half millimeters per inch. So maybe I want a little panel that's going to be about a quarter of an inch. So five or six millimeters is about what that would be. So I'm going to go ahead and type six millimeters in, not 260, but six millimeters, hit enter, and the box should become six millimeters tall. Now, I want it to be a keychain or something, uh, but I'm not quite sure how big I want it to be. Well, that's why I thought ahead and I brought a ruler with me, right? I can visualize how big that might be when I lay it out, but I'm still not quite sure because I, I can't just see those measurements in front of my face. So what I also had is a sheet of blank paper. So I'm gonna go ahead, take a handy dandy pen or pencil, and I'm gonna think like, what's a good shape for this? I'm gonna start thinking about maybe how I want this thing laid out. So start to draw a size. Now my name is pretty short, it's only four letters. So I'm gonna kind of roughly draw this very rough here. I'm just trying to get something that I kind of like the size of. And maybe I'll figure out the exact logistics later, but kind of like this. So you can see I've drawn a simple concept sketch and I'm like, I like this size. I like the size in comparison to my hand. I can see this dangling from, you know, my house keys and stuff. You know, I got room. That seems about right. So from here, take my handy dandy ruler and I'm gonna measure it. Best thing is because it's a rough sketch and I kind of like it, I can uh, adjust the dimensions if they're not lining up super perfect like I want. So for instance, this is about 60 millimeters long. That seems not too bad for me. So I'm gonna go ahead and swap the length to be 60 millimeters. I'll double check to make sure that's the right dimension. Okay, that's not the dimension I want. I actually want the other dimension to be 60. Just happens sometimes you're not quite sure what it assumes to be length and width. That's always a problem I have with rectangles. You're never quite sure what they mean by length or width. Seems the same a lot of the time, but anyway. In this case, I'm going to jump down to width instead, make sure that's 60, All right? I'm gonna go back, take my ruler again, try not to unplug my computer in the process, measure the short side of my rectangle that I've drawn here, because I kind of like it. That looks to be about 30. So that's interesting. I've made it, you know, half as tall as it is long. That seems about a good proportion. So I'm gonna go ahead and change the other dimension to 30. And sorry, my computer's just running a little bit slow with everything I'm running at the moment. It's kind of hard with these um, browser-based things when you're doing like streaming, video recording, and a bunch of other stuff. <laughs> On top of it, it gets a little mad at me. But this I know can be 30. All right, so once that updates, boom. I've got the shape that I like. So there's my little platform based on my quick little sketch. Now, this is also great, like Sean, for instance, if this is a project with your kids, you kind of give them a few constraints, but kind of think about maybe they want to draw a cooler shape. Maybe they want to start with a heart or a circle or some other cool shape or a sun. And we would build those platforms differently, but it would all start with a sketch that we can use to figure out the right sizes and proportions that we like. Now, one thing you'll note about my design I added a little circle with a little cutout to allow it to be put on some kind of ring. So how am I gonna do it? Did you guys hear that? <laughs> I don't know what that was. Yeah, that was very you. scary. I don't know. Maybe it was me. Oh, that's weird. That's scary. What the hell was that? Anyway, okay. 
Sorry. Um, so I'm going to take my sketch and I'm going to look at that circle. I want to know how big the circle is. So I've drawn it to be about uh, 12 millimeters, about half an inch. It's not a bad size. So the way I've drawn it, I've kind of sort of got the circle centered around the corner of my rectangle. So what I'm going to do, oh, I know what it is. One moment. Oh, boy. Might have to. Oops. Cool. All right. Back to start. All right. So we've got this going on. OK. I like the size. I like where we are. For the moment, to make things a little bit simpler, because I don't want to change it, I'm going to lock this shape so I can't edit it anymore, because I, I like what it's doing. Um, and it'll make the next step a little bit easier. So I'm going to take a cylinder. And in this case, I'm going to let it snap to the ground. I can either, again, hold C to snap it there automatically, or just note that the cursor is telling me it's already snapped there. And I want to align it just right. So. I go to the top view and going to move the cylinder to where it's kind of in the corner there. Now, this is where Tinkercad can get a little bit weird. You know, you're trying to align things a certain way. There's some sophistication with the alignment tools, but it's usually pretty generic. Um, so you just have to be aware of kind of a little bit of physical error you're going to have as part of it. So if I have both selected and I can align them, let's take a look. So let me see, maybe I want to have the middle of this, oh, whoop, wrong direction. I have a question. Yeah, go you know, ahead. Like, because there's so many of the squares that, that help you to align, is there any any like blueprint or directions that say this square does this, the black squares do this? Like because you know, because you could you could use you could grab onto each one of these little squares and manipulate the shape kind of similarly. Is there mm -hmm. any rhyme or reason to which which of these little squares you would use to align it? Um, right. So, I mean, uh, that's, that's an excellent question. Um, with a lot of the tools in here, the different shapes uh, are how they allow different forms of manipulation. So all these little squares here, the darker squares are usually directional. The lighter ones are usually altering the size. Um, what I'm trying to do is essentially, um, you know, again, the alignment tools in Tinkercad for how I'm going to align it perfectly leave a little to be desired. Um, for this particular operation of me trying to align it in the corner, the best thing to do might be to actually do this, which is kind of weird, because this is the center of it. Um, so I'm actually just going to eyeball the center and center here till it lines up about where I want it to be, because this position isn't super critical. If I was using a more sophisticated CAD program, I'd be able to snap that circle right onto the corner. But for now, you can see I've got these two black circles just kind of aligned with each edge, which would mean the center of this cylinder is right about where the center of that corner is. Because the alignment tools in Tinkercad are kind of like, OK, align to the side, align to the middle, or align to the other side, or top or bottom. We need something a little bit more nuanced than that, which, which can be a little challenging to set up. But again, it's kind of like the, the complexity of the tool and what you're trying to do. This will get close enough. We're not looking for thousands of an inch precision here. But I'll switch it back to solid real quick, because I just switched it to whole because it was a little easier to see. 
Um, and, okay, color's fine. Thank you. Um, it keeps moving away from the cylinder. Still want to edit the cylinder. Thank you. So I want to change the cylinder's height. And I want it to be the same height as the rectangle. So again, whoop. the chugginess is making it so it's hard for me to predict what I'm looking at when I let go. There we go. So you can see this changes the height. And I want it to be six, because that's what I made for the rectangle. Beautiful. Makes sense so far. Even as I'm making those edits, you saw that I was able to click into that box and tell it precisely how I want it to align or the size I wanted it to be. Um, but the other thing that I need is that I'm eventually going to need a hole through that as well. So I'm actually going to pull out another one. And you can see that that little circular cursor thing is showing me it's on top of the current cylinder. And I'm going to want this to be a little bit smaller. So if that one's 12 and 12, I'm going to probably want like a sizable amount on each side. So in which case, I'm going to change this. Let's see what 15, well, probably 14 on each side. Let's see what that looks like. 14. Look at it from the top. Excuse me there. So you can see I've got, it's a little smaller because I want to create a border. And so if you think about it, if it's 14 and 20, the difference between the two is four millimeters, but it's a circle. So it's gonna be spread all around. So that means that six millimeters is split in two. I've got a three millimeter ring that will be created once I punch out the center. So now I'm going to align the two cylinders to make sure I've got those where I want them. Oop, keeps moving way faster than I think. There we go. I'm gonna hold shift to select the two cylinders, go to alignment control, and I want center and Hmm. Keeps showing me the preview, but I'm just trying to get it to let me pick the center. I might have to alter my perspective a little bit. If the stutteriness is frustrating for you, trust me, it's frustrating for me. <laughs> anyway, what I need to do is I want to be able to see see how those little dots are showing up. Those dots are showing me how it's going to align on which axis. So I just need to select the center dot. Ah, but it keeps disappearing every single time I mouse over to it. There we go. Center in that direction. Now I need... That looks to be exactly what I need there. I was able to align them. So now you can see they're pretty much centered on each other. Now what's also cool is the height of the uh, second cylinder isn't gonna matter so much and you'll see in a moment why. But what I'm gonna do is I'm going to modify this. I'm going to select the cone and drag it straight down to where I can see the bottom is kind of appearing there through the bottom. I'm gonna turn it to hole type material. Now I'm gonna do this in two steps. I'm going to select the first cylinder and my block, and we're going to combine those. So I have one shape with my little loop on it. 
Then I'm going to take that shape plus the second cylinder, and I'm going to combine them. Now, why do you think I did it in that way? Why did it in that so that you, you can, uh, when it prints, it'll print it as one shape? One shape, but why did I do the sequence of combination in the way I did? Why didn't I cut the whole, why didn't I cut this whole first and then combine it with the rectangle? I don't know, because I would have done the whole first. <laughs> There's a reason why I went in that order. So okay. if I, ungroup them then I can ungroup this watch what happens and it may not be as dramatic um, just based on what I'm looking at here but I'm trying to make sure that the hole and everything gets cut properly so you might be able to see what's going to happen right here but let's say I take my whole cylinder and this cylinder and I combine them first. Let's see if you guys can see what's going to happen. The part of the uh, rectangle is still in the circle. Yeah. And how did I know that was going to be a problem? Where did I align the circle originally? Oh, the circle, when you aligned, are you saying that this, the small circle inside the middle Inside the when I when I aligned the bigger circle, the bigger cylinder, how did I align it yeah. to the rectangle? Oh, you kind of kind of eyeballed it. Oh, you centered it, but you kind of had to adjust it on. Right, uh, and I eyeballed the center of the circle on the vertex yeah. of this corner, meaning that if the center of that circle gets cleaned out before I combine them, the little tip of this rectangle is going to be in there like this appeared. But what I want is that to be completely punched out. So again, that's where you think of the sequence of events when you're combining these shapes to make sure you're getting precisely what you want. Certain times uh, when you're learning CAD, they will say, think of it as if you're building it, you know? So if you were making this shape in the wood shop, let's say, and you were making it out of wood, you would probably make the whole outer shape first and then use the drill press to drill out that final shape. That might be the easiest way to form it. You wouldn't drill the hole first and then hope the rest of your shape kind of fits on your piece of wood. You would make sure everything gets cut out first. Um, in this case, I knew that I would have a little bit of rectangle left over had I cut the hole first. I think you can also just combine all this stuff right away and it'll work as well. Um, but let's see, does that... No, it didn't. It only combined the two solid objects first, I think. But yeah. Um, but by combining them in this way, I knew that I saved myself the struggle of trying to figure out why the hole had extra stuff in it. And honestly, to be perfectly mm -hmm. frank, a lot of that comes from trial and error. I've made a mistake like that millions of times <laughs> doing this kind of work. And mm. it's something that I've caught in different design patterns I've done throughout the past. And it's just something I know to watch out for sometimes. Now, with this cool shape that we have, we've got our dynamic shape. This is what will form the basis of our um, name tag. That's basically what we're going to be putting our words on. So if you all remember, the text tool is how we add uh, words to objects. Um, to make this placement, again, I'll probably just eyeball it a little bit. The reason why I would eyeball it um, is up for a few different reasons. Number one, if I wanted to make sure the name text was perfectly centered on the rectangle, I would do all of my alignment to the rectangle, then combine the shapes. That way, I because if I try to align it now, it's going to be the center of this entire object, which includes a little bit of this overhang, meaning that the, cent the geometric center of it 
is actually not on the center of the rectangle, but actually a little bit over to the left. And that's just quirks of CAD software that you kind of get used to after a while. Um, but for all intents and purposes, if it's a fun kid project, a class project, I think they'll have a little bit more fun kind of having a fun location for their name than worrying about perfect absolute alignment. Although mm -hmm. I was a weird kid and I love perfect absolute alignment. So your results may vary. Gotcha. But anyway, to, I'm sorry, did you have a question, Sean? No, I'm good. Okay, cool. <laughs> just just uh, reacting a bit. Um, but, oh, and I see Javi has joined. Uh, anyway, um, but back to what we're doing. So just to kind of show how we would finish this off. See again, that little circle is showing me where text is going to snap to. It's real big, but don't freak out. We're going to change that after, but I at least know it's snapping to the top surface there. Now, remember, first things first, the text. Um, there are a lot of meta kids out there. I've worked with them. They love just leaving it as text and like being real crazy and postmodern with it. You know, arty kids are great. They're fun. Uh, but for all intents and purposes, I'll put my name there. Feel free if you're following along to use it as well. Sean, this is going to be super easy for you because we have the same name. So it's going to be like you're doing it. So this will be great. Um, but I'm going to write my name there and Sean's name. No ownership. Mm -hmm. and, um, Sean, you um, didn't have to say that it was your name. Sean was right, it, it is a Sean. That is Sean's name. Name. No, it's not <laughs> Sean's name. Yeah, we have no ownership here. It's everybody's, everybody's got a name. On. <laughs> but at least both of us can agree that's the right way to spell it. <laughs> exactly. Everything else? Uh... Yeah, I don't know. Those other guys. Um, this is where we're going to pick any kind of cool different font we want to have as part of it. Um, as a side note, less complicated fonts will print a little bit better. Um, that meaning uh, right now in multi-language or if you were to pick serif font. Uh, for those of us who don't know a lot about fonts, the serif is... Um, the extra little, see how it gets a little bit thicker here and how the A kind of has a little tail and the N has little flat parts here. Those are the serifs of the font. When a font is sans serif, it excludes those types of features. Um, and those would be considered simpler or more modern appearing fonts. So that, that's kind of a little bit of that mystery there. Um, it, again, honestly, like you can print whatever you want. If, if they download a freeware font that's all crazy script or something like that, they can use that as well. Um, I think for certain web app versions of this, you are kind of just limited to what they're going to have in this drop down. And I, I think it's pretty much just these. Um, and, and sans mono is just sans mono spacing. That's the big difference there. Mono spacing refers to each letter gets the exact same spacing as you move across. Um, when it's the regular sans serif font, that means each letter has particular spacing for the letters. Uh, it just is a more natural way to express the font. It's a little bit less dramatic here with this particular type, but just so you know what that is, I'm sure if you're doing this with curious kids, they're going to ask. So um, I like what we got here. Um, but I got to get it to fit. So I'm going to click on the top plane there so I can get a look down on it. Um, and even to get, uh, if I click there, that's not what I want. But um, now what I can do is I can just make that name fit on there. So I'm going to go ahead, just squish that. Um, and if you hold shift, it will maintain the aspect ratio. That is the length and width of the text. I can see what I'm using as my layout. See that dotted line that's showing the actual footprint of it? I'm using that to make sure it's on the shape. And then I'm going to use the arrow keys to kind of just nudge it a little bit. And, you know, visually where I think it looks pretty good centered on there. Again, I'm using those dotted lines there to kind of see what kind of border I've created. 
and I'll nudge it a little bit. If you hold shift and hit the arrow keys to nudge, it nudges a lot. But if you don't hold shift and use the arrow keys, it nudges a little bit. Um, it's based on, on the snap setting, which you can see right down here is set to one millimeter. So I think that's pretty good. I'm eyeballing it. I kind of like where that is. But now we have the interesting choice of how the text will interact with the name tag. So, um, and I keep using, I keep using different CAD shorthand, which is why I keep pausing for a second. Um, but right now, my name, the name, is uh, right on top, and it's still pretty thick. In fact, if I open up my text editing here, it's actually set to be pretty high. It's at 10 millimeters. So this is where I can set, do I want the font to be proud, that is, above this surface? Do I want it to be below that surface? Um, or do I want it to be flush with that surface, surface, which really wouldn't make sense, but we could achieve by actually punching the text out of the object. So there's a few different ways we can handle this. Number one, how much stick out do we want? We can make it six millimeters, exactly the same thickness as our uh, footprint. That's probably not too bad. Um, you can even go probably a little bit shallower. Again, your printer might behave a little bit differently. My thought would be like three millimeters would probably look pretty decent on top of a six millimeter plate. Um, it would also mean it would be less likely to snag on stuff. Three millimeters is about an eighth of an inch. So that's probably a pretty good way to go about it. It also means more of the mass is on the plate and doesn't have a bunch of stuff hanging off that could easily get snapped. Uh, because again, it's going to be probably printing with the layers going on, on this short side, the layers will be going in that direction. So these letters could snap off if the right uh, person hit it in just the right way. So that's probably a safe way to do it but um so just to kind of show what that would look like select my text select my background object combine them and now i've got a name tag fit to print um and i would go over to export and you can see here i can export it as stl certain other slicers may use obj i've never come across one myself but STL is a file that can file type that can be read by a slicer to generate the G code that would allow a 3D printer to print it. Um, and that's what you're going to want to export it as um, to go forward. However, uh, somebody may want a more unique look to their uh, letters. So I'll just go over another way you can express this font. Um, and if we want to have a little bit of fun here, I'm going to deselect everything. I'm going to select the font, and this time I'm going to go for broke, and I'm going to make it real thick, and I think you'll get an idea of what I'm going to be doing. I'm going to make it 10 millimeter thick, and now what I'm going to do is just carefully, now remember the dark arrows move it, do not distort it. So I'm going to take that and I'm just going to punch it through. So let's see, minus four, minus five, minus six. That should mean I've got a little bit on the top and bottom. Oh, just about. Got to make it a little taller. Let's go for 20. The height here really won't matter too much. Um, for what I'm about to show you, what really matters is that it's actually punched through on both sides. So you can see there, it's just about flush to that. Let me go ahead, just drag it down a few more millimeters that I've got it equal on both sides. Oop, sorry about that. My chuggy computer is making it challenging to show you comfortably. But uh, now I'm gonna go ahead, select both objects. Oh, but first, before I do that, I'm actually going to turn my text into whole type. Select that object, combine them, and when all is said and done, I've now 
punched through the name tag. However, does anybody see a little problem with this? And feel free to type the answer or say it, whatever you're comfortable with. Yes, Javi sees it. The E and the A. There's nothing supporting them. They would just fall out, disappear. Um, so there's a little bit of post-processing I'd have to do to fix that. Now, I could also just not care. And maybe I want a little postmodern look, in which case I would make sure to delete those two bodies before printing because they're not going to be supported. The other thing I could do is I could put a little rectangle in there to connect those to the main body to make sure those stay as part of the shape. And I'll demonstrate that real quick with the E. Snap this. Actually, I'm going to snap it to the ground because I know my name tag right now is snapped to the ground. So now I know both of these things are touching the ground. And this box doesn't have to be super big. Um, generally, what we've been talking about, the smallest features we've been working with are about three millimeters. So I'm going to want, if I recall correctly, let's see, is that the right direction? Yes, I remembered. So I'm going to zoom in a little bit. So you can see what I'm doing. I'm just creating a rib that will connect them. And I can even make this probably a little smaller if it will let me select it. There we go. And let's see if I can get this too. Yeah, it's all right. Gonna just nudge it so that I want it kind of like in the middle of that E shape, that little floating shape that's part of e, e there we go so you can see how i'm connecting it to the main body uh, i'm gonna want to make sure for extra strength um you can pass it through the whole object you just want to make sure uh it's a little rib that's going to touch both sides of this floating object and then the height of it let me change to six. <clears throat> it somehow changed to 200, everybody. That's fun. Six. Bingo, bango. Now I select this and the new rib I created. Combine them, and you can see now I've added a little rib that will support that little floating part of the E. That would be something I'd have to do to keep them all together, or simply just delete it. I can easily just delete this body, either in the slicer or here in Tinkercad, by just putting a shape over it and blotting it out. I could demonstrate that as well. I would actually use the scribble tool for this operation. Drag my scribble tool out. It's gonna open up the scribble tool editor. Just to demonstrate a simple way to kind of approach this. You can even use this to create your ribs if you wanted some custom ribs. Um, go to edit the scribble. So. Hold on. I forgot it actually doesn't show you a preview of the word. So that actually doesn't make sense to use the scribble tool because I was hoping it would show you a 2D preview so you could sketch right over that A piece. But because we got this little floater, you can go for the top view. And then you can just add shapes to slowly subtract it. So I would just put whole shapes just below it. 
and then use them to slowly carve it out till I get the size I want. It's just a little slow going with something like Tinkercad, but you can see that I can slowly carve that out and create open space in that A so that I have no random floating pieces in my 3D print and it will print more successfully with using less material. Okay, any questions about the name tag process or anything else with Tinkercad or other modeling questions? That was extremely helpful. And it just puts it put a lot of the pieces that we were talking about last time, put it all together for me. So that that was awesome. Appreciate it. You're welcome. So I'm going to share my, some examples here, and I'll, I'll talk a little bit about the process of working through it, and some for some context here. So what I want to show is a few examples of how. CAD can be used for various different types of projects. Um, first and foremost, um, one project that 3D CAD and 3D printers and I think access to that kind of stuff for, which is great, is repair. Uh, repair is a big thing uh, that is very useful for 3D printing, even if you're sending out to Shapeways for 3D printing or having access to printers at Makehaven. Being able to successfully make replacement parts for a lot of things that don't have them it's actually quite helpful. So this is kind of a kind of a very esoteric example, but it's something in my life. So this might not look like anything to anybody. Um, for a little bit of backstory, um, my brother is a gigantic Transformers collector. And so when you're a collector like that, um, you sometimes come across ones that are damaged. Some of them are manufactured with faulty parts that eventually need repair. So he tends to utilize my skills to repair a lot of examples of action figures in his collection. Uh, this one, of course, as another little bit of backstory, there is a problem that plagues a lot of Transformers figures. It is called Gold Plastic Syndrome, or GPS. It comes from a weird metallic mixture of plastic that causes weird imperfections, that causes them to break under stress. So this is the waste component of a very expensive figure that was released in 2018 that actually suffers from this type of breakage. This is actually breakage that happened out of the box. This piece just broke, and you can even see there's a discontinuity that probably would have led to a break eventually in the corresponding piece to the other side. So the challenge my brother gave me was could I um, build replacement parts that could make this incredibly expensive figure, and I will not for the faint of heart talk about how much he paid for this figure. Um, can I turn it into a usable figure once again, using my skills in 3D design? So um, um, the first things first, um, you take a lot of measurements. So it was a lot of, again, bringing out my handy dandy caliper and actually working to document as many measurements as I could. The strategy I took here, uh, both of these sides use these three holes to orient and align themselves together. So I actually used uh, one of these two as my origin, my point, and I used that to basically measure every single aspect of these, the organic curvature, um, the internal pieces of it, um, I think for, a simplistic demonstration. Let's see what's open here. Um, for example, jump to documents, go to this is kind of the thing where I realized, man, I really need to label my project folders better because I have one that's just called digital projects and one that's called miscellaneous projects. And I have no rules on which makes which, which. But anyway, that's a me problem. Um, but what I'm gonna do is I just want to 
Here we go. I think it's okay, cool. So what I did was um, this is a sample of the printed component where it's supposed to be replaced. So I printed these and I was able to demonstrate to my brother how I was able to recreate these parts to actually work properly with the figure. Um, I'll see if I can, am I allowed to share these browser windows? Let me see. Yes, I can. So what's cool about Mac is that it simulates STLs. So here I can show you, these are the actual STL files that were printed. So you can see I created all of the different hole features, all the different structural features. There are two large ratcheting joints that actually have to fit here. Getting a little bit in the weeds here, ratchets have two components, the pawl and the gear wheel. The pawl is what moves and clicks when a ratchet moves. It's just a little tooth that fits right into the different gear teeth of the ratcheting wheel. And then, of course, specifying all those points where it has to connect and interact with the figure. So just some cool background stuff. Then as you get into, you know, sophisticated action figure repair, uh, you take it one step further, you paint it, you try to color match it. I wasn't able to get a full color match to the pink, but I was able to get something that decently looks like it was a stock component after I finished it and made it look whole again. So I don't know. Anybody who's a fan of Transformers probably knows who this character is. Beast Wars Megatron from the 90s. You know, it's a pretty cool figure. If you're a fan of it, you know, not everybody's cup of tea. But some other stuff. So that's, in there. that's a repair example. But a lot of us don't necessarily have to repair something. We actually might want to start with something completely from scratch. How do you start from something that has no constraints? Well, what you do is you actually build your constraints. When I teach to design, when I teach design to people, a lot of what I talk about is, um, believe it or not, when you're being creative and thinking creatively and working on a project, what you're actually trying to do, do is figure out the constraints to make fewer and fewer choices as you go to get to that final solution. You know, it sounds like counterintuitive because to be creative, you have no restriction. But really what you're doing is you're slowly creating more and more rules till you find a solution that works for you. So here's an example of a project where I did just that. So a little bit of background for it before I reveal it. Um, in 2020, as we all know, lockdown was pretty tough. I was living in Chicago at the time. There was a couple that my partner and I knew and they had a little kid who uh, was upset that he wasn't able to go to the Field Museum anymore. So he drew a picture for his Christmas list and uh, they wanted a toy Field Museum, not something that they really make. So uh, my partner was like, could you make a toy Field Museum for them and we can give it to them for Christmas? And this was like the middle of October. I was like, uh, I guess. So that's how I got roped into this project. So first things first, um, I created a very simple CAD model of just the overall layout and how I wanted it to work. So you can see here, the main play feature was, it was going to have a closed compact storage mode, and then you could open it up into the full play museum mode. The size constraints that I used, so each of these panels here, um, were exactly the size of half of a big Lego stud panel. The big fun feature here was that it was going to be compatible with Legos. So as this child grew up, um, it would be able to grow with them in terms of complexity and play value. And it also had the added benefit of all of our artist friends who had Legos at home could build their own Lego exhibits, mail them to us, and would actually become part of their own little field museum. So um, that was the start point. And you can see here, I've built out generally how I want everything to work. This was a rough model. This was helped me figure out the size. I was able to make sure everything would work the way I wanted. And I was able to simulate the closing and opening to make sure all the parts would fit. Then I spent many, many weeks and late nights figuring out how I would break this up into different mortise and tenon components that I would glue together and assemble into the final design. So I designed all the pieces. I found a laser cutting contractor and I made this. Um, 
It is the full design with uh, etched windows. It's, you can see this is a sense of scale with a little mini Lego person and it opens up. We even had a, a friend who was really good with fabrics and they wanted to make banners that could fit inside the building and stuff. And this literally took, because my laser cutter vendor was a little delayed, he literally got me the parts December 23rd. And I basically spent from then till Christmas morning without sleep building this thing and troubleshooting a lot of issues that I found only afterwards when I started building it to the point where I've actually completely thrown this design in the garbage and have built out a version two. Um, and I can, I'll bring up the version two a little later. It takes a second to open, but if anybody's interested, I can show you guys what version two looks like. But this is an example of how you build out constraints from zero. I knew that I wanted to make some kind of thing that looked sort of like the Field Museum. It's not a perfect one-to-one. -one. That would be adaptable with Lego pieces. So I started with, I could buy these Lego plates. I used that to figure out the footprint, figured out how many floors I wanted to have because of that. And then also constrained it with how much we wanted to actually spend on wood for this project. So there were a lot of several lot, several constraints I had to weigh and figure out how to make it work. And even like, you know, laser cutting this custom cornice piece on it. The back of it, I don't know if you can see from any of these pictures here, but there's also a laser etched back that has the date, everybody that contributed to the project. And something I didn't get a picture of were all the different uh, exhibits that were built out, but uh, they got a really cool Egypt and mummies exhibit, which I think was put over here gems taxidermy animals a gift shop <laughs> and a little popcorn vendor actually was put right there so just some fun stuff that i you know to help make 2020 a little bit more fun than it was at the time so they ended up loving it i still get instagram posts from them where he has added new exhibits and they've you know played around adding new stuff to it so it's fun to see how it's a toy that has slowly grown with them and, and a bit of a successful project um so if you guys are interested, a little later, I can show you some of the uh, before and after on how you would advance something like this forward, because I've actually made a version two that's wildly different from this based on what I learned from here. But for a third case study, um, this is something that comes from my professional work in terms of how you deliver something through CAD to use it as a tool to um, demonstrate new ideas. So this is a project, um, a client came to me and wanted to design bird feeders that used little um, little cartridges to refill the fluid for hummingbird feeders. And they wanted a designer to help them explore different ways it could be done, different designs that could utilize this technology, and um, how uh, what different styles it could look like to be unique in the market. So what I delivered to them were these few designs right here. So this is what in the design world we would call a concept sheet. It has a full rendering of the product. Um, all of this is just uh, visualization. These are virtual things I created to show them what it looks like. Um, so I showed them what it would look like um, with full materials and all the different styling that would be on it. I showed them a sequence of use diagram, how the little pod, it's like a little pudding cup of fluid would be inserted and then a little poker would poke a hole in it for the bird to drink out of. And then also some elevation views so they can see how it's laid out. Um, the design incorporates different procedures they were familiar with. And I'm showing them how they can take a, a similar a, a sort of familiar form factor and turn it into something new. But I also took the time to show them wildly different designs. Like what if we wanted it to look uh, more like flowers <clears throat> because we didn't have to be limited to the traditional style of a uh, typical hummingbird feeder. We could make it look like a plant and have all these different pods look like different blossoms that a bird could drink out of. Um, they also wanted to see what it would look like with different shaped pods, which I think is less interesting looking, but still doable. Um, and also other pod shapes like this triangular one. It's almost like a weird Capri Sun bottle kind of shape. Um, but uses, again, a, a different type of system to uh, insert and open them up. And then, of course, just little boxes in a cage, something that they wanted to see. All made here using CAD, all using all the techniques I've talked about from using different materials to having a trusty ruler nearby. 
and all starting with basic sketches to help me figure out how I want to portray these different ideas and show them to people. So these kind of show the different ways CAD can be a tool that is something you use to um, illustrate ideas, to design things, and also work very closely with different people, family members, clients to, um, you know, get new ideas, create new products, or fix things that are broken that you've always tried and really annoyed you weren't fixed. So um, that's just a little bit about that. Just some basic case studies about me and my life being a weirdo. Um, you know, uh, more than happy to answer any questions that you all might have about those processes and what I do. Um, but, you know, the last 15 minutes here, just open questions, open comments, uh, please. My mind is blown. That was pretty amazing. The uh, that museum piece was insane. Thank um, you. I have you've given me so much to, to think about, and also how to plan out some stuff with my kids. Um, this was amazing. I appreciate it. Thanks a lot. Thank you, Sean. Thank you, Sean. Um, mm -hmm. Yeah, and again, um, we're all you know. Adam, myself, other facilitators, um, Nathan as well, when you guys meet them. Um, we're all here to help you all out, figure out how to use these tools to best um, you know, visualize what you're trying to do, whether it be something totally new, again, something you're trying to fix, or you just want to become familiar with a lot of these tools. You know, always um, want to make sure you all feel comfortable doing this, um, but also realize that like, what I want you all to realize is that, especially when it comes to CAD, as I've mentioned before, I've been a professional designer and I've been using CAD for um, oh man, like 20, going on 25 years now. And it's terrifying that I'm that old, but also <laughs> um, uh, I still find things that are confusing or weird or odd about the processes. Um, and every new project presents its own challenge. No two products, no two projects, no two challenges will ever be exactly the same. So understand that each one is a learning process and everybody starts with that first step. So in just learning how to approach different projects, you will find the metaphors. Oh my God, pardon me, that was a disgusting burp, but you'll find the metaphors and explanations for yourself that work best for you to understand how to move forward. For some of us, it's thinking about how it would work as a functional object or how one shape cuts into another or how a machine would make it. Or um, sometimes just having to draw it out, see it on a piece of paper and then understand it. Be open to those tools, be open to that way of visualizing because that is how you'll become stronger at these tools when you learn how to tell yourself in a way that makes sense. That's going to be true mastery and also be okay with the growing pains of that. It's going to take a while maybe before even Tinkercad feels like a tool you're comfortable with. You know, even me as a veteran of CAD, when I jump to Tinkercad, there are things, as I mentioned before, like I'm trying to do shorthands I'm used to in SolidWorks, which don't exist in Tinkercad whatsoever. So that's where I, when I'm kind of like, uh, um, okay. Uh, that's me like, oh, right. I can't do this here. Crap. How do I do it in this program again? And so just realize there's always going to be growing pains with this stuff. So. It's a big journey. Don't be scared to, to take those first couple of steps. None of us are here to judge you or say, oh, it's too easy for me to work out. It's like, no, it's, it's just, we all learn and we're here to help you guys learn. Um, I just wanted to tag on to what Sean was saying that your three exhibits there were, were awesome to see in terms of the, the transformer, the field news, that's crazy. And then also your, uh, your CAD design work. That's all pretty cool. Thanks. It's um, all a matter of paying attention to process and material. Um, I can show people what version two looks like if you guys want to see that. Um, will it let me share a virtual? Yeah, it will. So this is a little weird. You can see it's quite wildly colored. This is version two. Um, you can see I'm incorporating a lot of the joinery and how it's put together. The big thing I wanted to change between version one and version two was paying attention to the stock materials and how it's all put together. 
So the colors represent the different thicknesses of materials I'm going to be using and the different processes that they have. But here's the real strength here. So each of these um, tools, each, each of these parts, excuse me, in this assembly are actual separate components I've drawn and I'm able to assemble them all digitally to make sure they're gonna fit. I'm not gonna have any weird interferences, but what I'm also able to simulate is and will let me do this. Come on, come on. <laughs> I'm doing too much on my computer, so it's very angry with me right now. Let's see. Come on, this is the cool thing. Let me do the cool thing. Yes, there it is. It's trying, it's trying. It's trying to simulate the opening for me, <laughs> but I can actually simulate the swinging hinge of it opening. Eh? I'm probably doing too much stuff, but you can see it moved a little bit and, and that's what I'm hoping will be somewhat impressive, but it's not very, sorry. Um, but I'm able to actually simulate how all the parts will operate around each other. Um, and I can show myself to make sure, uh, here we go, just change the angle. I mean, that's part of it. Come in, you know you wanna open. There you go, come on, there you go. You can do it. There you go, buddy. <laughs> this is what I mean working with SOLIDWORKS. <laughs> it's like, sorry, no. Um, but yeah, I can simulate um, the way it opens up. If There we go. I can drag both of these open to various angles. I can make sure that the parts are gonna clear. I can make sure that everything fits the way I think it's going to fit. And through my parametric assembly and design, I can also update these parts quickly if I find that there's an interference I wasn't aware of before. Um, and that's what these tools allow us to do. So yeah, I can actually simulate. There we go, oh my God, there we go. I can simulate in real time how it opens and I can make sure like I can verify that none of these parts will collide with each other. You know, So this represents probably a few months of planning work of me just trying to think about more sophisticated ways not only to design this, but as you can see, like different ways to conceal joinery or show it. Um, you can even see like here on the front, I've changed the design slightly, even adding these cool little lamp posts, which would be made out of wood and stuff. Just thinking of different ways I might want to design it, add additional details, and just have more fun. You know, all just for me, there's no reason to make it. I just, I don't know, I like torturing myself sometimes, um, but you know, just eventually I'll be making it. I gotta get already. I'm looking at probably, I think I six sheets of quarter inch plywood. I think I'm going to need for just a lot of it. So I, I got to get quite a bit. So did you, I gotta uh, say. Did, dare I ask, did you pitch it to the field museum or was <laughs> putting a field museum with a gift shop in the gift shop of the field museum? Would that be too, too many layers? <laughs> too meta. I, everybody was like, oh, man, you got to do that. I was like, ah, I don't know. They probably don't care, you know, or they, they've, they've seen, seen it. it before. They see it every day. Yeah. See it every day. They don't. Care. But yeah, so it's just just kind of like a fun thing to do to kind of make 2020 a little more bearable and also just a fun side project. So I don't know. Eventually, you might see me assembling it in the wood shop or something. I'll I'll be getting to it one of these centuries. But That'd be cool. see. Look forward to seeing it. Yeah. So that kind of, uh, you know, that ends the 2D, 3D design unit. Like I said, um, always here on Slack to answer questions y'all might have, uh, help you out with any 2D, 3D design challenges or any questions you might have about CAD work. Just because you're moving on to Nathan doesn't mean you all become ghosts to me. I'm of course always at your beck and call to help out with stuff. Again, my hours are always Wednesday nights, six to nine. Um, so never be afraid to show up and say hi and, and ask for help on anything. If I don't have an active appointment, you know, you're more, more than happy to help y'all out with anything you got to work on, whether it be 3d printing, laser cutting, however, anything with the CNC, it's gonna have to be over at Adam. Cause he is the CNC whisperer slash God slash owner, basically to an extent. I see you at it more than anybody else, Adam. So let's just say, oh, okay, okay. Let's call a spade a spade. I've used <laughs> CNCs. Uh, 
You're you're not you're not off the hook that soon, Sean. We're still we're still on two D, three D digital fabrication until next week. So if anybody wants to come in, I will be in Sunday at noon as per usual for my office hours. Um and my facilitator hours are Wednesday as well. Um, but if anybody wants to go through any CAD stuff or anything else that we've been working on. Um, last week, Gina and I walked through some Fusion 360 stuff, which was cool. Um, so if anybody wants to look at, look more at Tinkercad or, uh, or anything, Inkscape, any of the tools that we've brought up, it has been, it has been a lot of software that we've talked about. And it can definitely help to go through it a little bit more. Um, but I think we are all set. Um, all right. Well, have fun, everybody. Don't be a stranger. And uh, get out there and explore the world of 2D, 3D design. Wish I could put a little rainbow there or something like SpongeBob, but I can't. Anyway, have a good one, everybody. And uh, I'll right. be seeing you around the space. Thank you. Too. Thank um, you. Appreciate it.